no one sees the other side of your life as a, as a family uh, life or a husband and you know right. a father to kids and things like that. They only see the football aspect of it. Couldn't be more excited to spend time with our guest today, Mr. Elvis Gerbach. He's been a Wolverine, a 49er, a Chief, and a Raven. But most importantly, he's a child of God. Elvis is a man who's been on a journey not only as a college and NFL quarterback, but as one who is searching for faith. And so today we'll spend time talking about family, about winning and losing, and about how ultimately we reach a point to where we let God be number one in our lives because it makes the journey that much sweeter. This is Elvis Gerbach. Tell me what it's like when you look back on your NFL career and you think about the day that you were drafted. Like, do you still feel that, like, that excitement? I mean, is that something that you can call back on? Or, you know, when okay, you so I've, I've got a great story about that because um, my wife, uh, her grandfather had passed away that weekend. And actually, so I was at home that Friday, Saturday, and I had to get back to school to Michigan. I had finals on Monday. And the wake was, I, I believe it was either Saturday or Sunday, and I was actually at the wake. I wasn't watching, a, I oh, wa wow. wasn't watching the draft at all. Um, so I was there and I was just about to leave to go back to Michigan to take my finals. My mom and dad showed up and said that I had gotten drafted by the 49ers. And my wife told me later on that she sat and said a little bit of a prayer to her grandfather, if anything you can do from heaven to help us out. And, and it just worked out great. And he, and he waited till the eighth round. He was exactly. probably pretty busy up there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up, I ended up getting drafted. Um, and then as I was driving back to Michigan, I'm sitting there going, okay, just got drafted. I still have to take my finals. I have to do all this stuff. That's so crazy. it was, it was, it was fun and crazy at the same time, but it was, it was a blessing and, and a disguise. But see, so. you think about this. So, so we watch the NFL draft or we think about these athletes who are doing this stuff. Who thinks that somebody that just got drafted is gonna take their finals like after you get no drafted? No one thinks that, yeah. No one, no one see, they see the kids sitting there in the draft room or maybe at their houses with their families and things like yeah. that. Um, they don't see the other side that there's maybe some family issues going on or like, like myself had to go back and take finals and things like that. Um, they see just the football aspect of it. Yeah. And really up and up, continuing on from there, what happens is as a football player, that's what you get defined as. No one sees the other side of your life as a, as a family a life or a husband and you know, right. a, a father to kids and things like that. They only see the football aspect of it. So you talk about that with your family, right? And you're drafted by the 49ers in an amazing career. I mean, people would kill to trade places with right. you, right? But it had its ups and downs. Um, things were tough in Baltimore when you went there. Probably didn't go the way that you wanted. Um, did it hurt you to know that your family had to watch some of the criticism that you would take? and? You know, being a family guy and people don't see that, is, is that Yeah, I will, I will tell you this. Uh, that's probably the hardest part of the business. When I was in Kansas City, my four years after I was in San Francisco, um, it was difficult on my dad. It got to the point where about my third or fourth year, my dad would come to the games and he would walk around the stadium because you couldn't sit in the stands because my wife and my kids at that time, I had two boys, they were real young, and they would sit in the stands and my parents would be there or my, my in-laws and you can hear the criticism in the stands. Yeah. And my family took it personal sure. and they knew who my wife was. So it kind of got heightened a little bit there. Um, so my dad eventually would get up during the game and just walk the stadium and just kind of watch it on the monitors as he was walking around. Wow. Um, so that was kind of something that when my brother told me about that, 
that really affected me, that my father couldn't even sit there and enjoy the game uh, and enjoy watching his son play without hearing all the criticism. Right. Um, and there was, there was other things that, you know, um, that what my wife had to put up with, you know, off the field mm. um, that were just, you know, uncalled for at times. Right. Um, but that's, my wife and I kind of talked about it. It's part of the business and you have to learn how to deal with it. And as a young couple trying to raise a family and trying to do the right things, it, it, it's hard. It's very difficult. So did that, when you wanted to retire, when you decided to retire, I should say, did that come into play? Was oh, sure it, it did. Yeah. Sure it did. When, when it started affecting my father uh, to the point where he couldn't even watch the games, that, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, and he and I talked about it a little bit. Uh, but also at the same time, you know, my son had uh, spina bifida occulta when I was in San Francisco. I had a major back surgery. Uh, so he had difficulties um, with a lot of his bowel movements and things like that. Now, if you met him now, today, he'd be totally fine. Yeah. I mean, you walk in this room right now, you wouldn't even think of that. Yeah, uh, but it'd we take were, me out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we were very blessed to have somebody in San Francisco uh, to do the surgery and then come back to Cleveland here at Rainbows uh, and to be able to have, uh, you know, kind of a sound foundation for him to kind of develop. But that was kind of like the driving factor of us getting out of the NFL a little bit because health is more important to our, to our sure. children and things like sure. that. Sure. So I think that we all have heard of at some point in our time the artist Vincent Van Gogh. And by our standards, we would look at everything that Vincent Van Gogh did and we would see probably one of the most successful painters on the planet. And the truth is, is that Vincent Van Gogh really never got to see the fruits of his labor. In his entire lifetime, Vincent Van Gogh only ever sold one painting. It wasn't until after he died that he became famous. He actually killed himself because he thought that he was a failure. He didn't see himself as God would see him. He saw himself as he thought he should be. He viewed success as what he was selling and not how he was using his talent. And I think that for all of us, the biggest thing that we need to concentrate day in and day out is that winning and losing is just part of life. That success comes from how much we learn from the times that we lose as much as we act in the times that we win. And that God's grace really never ever stops flowing into us. So unlike Vincent Van Gogh, in the times that things aren't turning out the way that we want, we still need to see ourselves as a child of God. We still need to see ourselves as someone who has worth, someone who has gifts, and someone who has talents. So you're in San Francisco, right? You, you, you're blessed to have this, uh, this doctor there that is able to treat your son, and you win the Super Bowl. Where do you go from there? Like, you know, you and I have talked, to, as friends, we've talked about every year you want to win the Super Bowl. Right. Is it harder to not get back there knowing that you already won it once? It's very difficult. It's yeah. very difficult. Once you win, when I was there my second year, we had won it. Uh, the year prior to that, we were in Dallas for the NFC Championship game, so we were on the road and we got totally demolished and we had to kind of revamp our team a little bit. Um, the year afterwards, um, with salary cap, a lot of guys came and went just yeah. because of that issue. And it's very difficult to get there on a consistent basis. You know, you and I sit here now and you look at the New, New England Patriots, I'm kind of like dumbfounded how they just go every year. Sure. It is, it's very difficult, but that's the highest pinnacle that you can get to in that profession. Um, and then trying to get back there again is, is something that everybody strives for. So many people can relate to that, whether it's in business or whether it's, right. um, you know, as an athlete or something like that. How do we deal with this winning and losing aspect? This, hey, we're at the top of who we are uh, and then things fall apart or things don't go the way that you want. And, and I think that your natural reaction to your playing is, is that, hey, this is affecting my family, this right. is affecting me. How did it affect you as a person with your family? I mean, because I know when things in my own life aren't going the right way, I take it out on them because they're closest to me. Exactly. Was that's, there a lot that's, of that? That's a natural thing that happens. 
what happened to me is this, is that in a blessing in disguise was uh, the fact that my son went through that surgery. Yeah. And it really put the perspective of what was truly, you know, uh, correct for me and my family um, is that, you know, my priorities weren't that way. It was, it was all about work. My family I could always trust, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then my faith aspect was totally on the back burner. Yeah. Um, so I had to kind of rearrange that, and it took me a long time to do that. But when I was playing, it was all about me, right. and it was all about playing. And, I and you're a young I, kid, so how do you not get caught right, up in that? Right, and I've been doing it for almost 15, 20 years up to that point you know, from growing up and that was my dream and doing that. And then I also wanted to have a family too. So yeah. I thought I was doing the right thing and, you know, fulfilling my dream and providing for my family at the same time. And that's the typical drive of every, you know, person in the business world that as long as I'm doing this, then it's going to provide for my family. I'm doing the right thing. But sometimes, like I said, that faith aspect gets tossed in the back. Sure. And as a public figure, would it irritate you or does it frustrate you when people think that you have everything that you could want and that you don't have issues? Like, I, I think that when people would see you or meet you, they'd be like, you've got to be so, like, your, your life's perfect. Well, I, I, okay, so you and I talked earlier. Um, what I like to make sure that people understand is that the success that people see, yeah. you know, especially in the NFL or any athletic endeavor, is that there's more failure then there is success. You see the success, right. and it's only probably 45%. The other part is all failure. And so how do you deal with that failure? How do you learn from that? Mm-hmm. And you have to go through that to understand what it takes to be successful. But then people only see the success part of it. They don't yeah. see the failure part of it and how you've rebounded, how you've learned from it, how you've grown from it. And, and even if you lose, you know, as a quality leader, guys will sit with you on the battlefield and they will say, we didn't come out on top today, but there was no greater honor than to fight with you in that battle. Right. And that's a sign of a, right. of a great leader. Right. You've got to be able to, as a leader, you've got to be able to accept failure because yeah. that's part of it uh, and be able to learn from it. Yeah. If you could, and oh, I know you're blessed, oh. but if you could, <laughs> Would you have flipped it so the tough times I came in Baltimore would have been first and you could have ended on the high note of the Super Bowl? Wow. Um, I know we got deep. <laughs> I, I, I'm a person that really believes everything's supposed to go the way it's supposed to. Yeah. And I think... I'm letting you be selfish yeah, for a moment. Uh, no, I, honestly, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. I would say this is that... Even all that success, all the, you know, getting to that point in the professional level, I really, if I could change one thing, having Christ really be the, the focal point of it. Yeah. And how much great it would have been when I was done playing. Yeah. And the highs and lows wouldn't have been as high and low. It would have been a steady, gradual climb. Yeah, I think that, <coughs> I think that when any of us look back at the pinnacle moments of our life in winning and in losing, we forget about the journey. Right. And, you know, even, even in my own ministry that, you know, we, I don't think about the journey. I think about what is the end product. Right. And so I don't enjoy it as much. I, I was watching the other day, um, Jerry Seinfeld was in, interviewing Michael Richards from, uh-huh. from Seinfeld who played Kramer. And that was one thing that Michael Richards said. He said, I just wish that I would have enjoyed the process more right. than us just worrying about the end result. Right. So I, I think that that's, uh, that's one thing that any of us um, think about often is, did I enjoy the journey as much as I should have? And, and sometimes you don't because you're so focused in on what you want to accomplish that each individual day you try to get better at what you do, and that's what I did. Um, and you, you're looking at the end result. You're yeah. not taking, like you said, that process, that, that development, that growth. You don't see that. Yeah. In Matthew's Gospel, we read about the transfiguration. This is a moment to which Jesus takes three disciples with him, and he goes up to the top of the mountain because he needs to show them exactly who he is. 
there's a couple things that happen on this mountain. First of all, Christ reveals himself in all his glory. He becomes like this white light. And the disciples are like, yes, this is who we know. This is the Jesus we walk with. We know that this is our Messiah. And Peter gets, I don't want to say cocky, but he gets comfortable in the moment. And he's like, Lord, it is good that we are here. And you know what Jesus has to be thinking? Yeah, of course it is. I brought you here. <laughs> but in that moment, Peter forgets that their work isn't supposed to be done on the mountain. Their work is to be done in the valley. I think that for you and I, this story has so much relevance today because the Lord is always trying to lead us up to the top of the mountain. He wants us to see the world from his view, the way that he sees us. And he wants us to know that he is Lord and he is God and that there is so much rich tradition within inside of our faith. But he is also saying, we can't live here. I want to go back, I want to take you back down to the valley where the work is to be done. And just like he eventually leads the disciples down the other side of the mountain to do their work, you and I have to know that the greatest work that we can do in our lives is in the time that we are valley living, searching for the mountaintop moment. So what do we do in the times that we can't see him? We have to make some of the changes in our lives that are important so that we can recognize that there is always self-worth even if things are tough or we've had a failure in a moment. All right, so let me ask you, your faith, you mentioned Christ, that you wish that he was more uh, part of the journey with you during those playing years. What turned it around for you? What makes you say that today versus when you were playing back then? Well, I will say this. It took me a long time. Um, after I was done, uh, retired from the NFL, I had a great opportunity to really spend a lot of time with my, my kids. My kids were at that age where they were... Um, second grade, kindergarten, and you know, three years old. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with them, um, coaching, doing all those things that my father had two jobs and was never home. And you know, as, a, as an athlete back when I was growing up, my dad wasn't usually at the games. Yeah. He was always you know, busy or working or doing something. Um, I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with my, with my kids. And I took advantage of that, but I felt as if there was something truly missing in my life. Um, there wasn't a peace and a happiness that I was enjoying. I enjoyed my family, and I, I still do. Yeah. But there was a wasn't a fulfillment there for myself personally. Right. Um, I ended up going to to see Father Larry Richards speak at a three um, three night um, mission. Yeah. Uh, so that night I went to confession um, in a room, one like this in a corner. Um, with the pastor over at my parish, who is now the bishop up in Grand Rapids. And I went to confession, and there's a line of people standing behind me, no less than 10 feet from me. And I am bawling my eyes out. Yeah. And just giving everything over. And from that moment on, it was truly something that I looked back at and said, you know what, let's change what, what's going on here. Yeah. And I really took it, and I still do to this day, um, I think there's a difference between practicing Catholic and having a true relationship with Christ. Sure. And I, I think that's really true, and I, that's what I want to kind of convey the message to some young kids. Yeah. Is that you develop that relationship with Christ on a daily basis. It's not going to just happen on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning right. for one hour, and then, and then the next Sunday it's just going to click in again. It's yeah. not going to happen that way. So for me it was a development over a long period of time. Uh, where was my relationship with Christ? And I can see the, the peace, the happiness, the fulfillment that I was looking for, um, and especially in the Eucharist. Um, I'm a daily mass goer, yeah. and that's why I kind of I have my beginning of my day is with Christ. And so you lower the age of daily mass goers by half when you're yes. in there, right? So <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, hey, could Elvis come? Because we just need to take it down like 10 years. You know, and, and the consistency is important because just as you have wins and losses on the football field, just because you say, Lord, I want you to take my life, I always tease people. I'm like, if you put Christ in charge of your life, you find out that he is a terrible driver. I mean, because right. he doesn't take you where you want to go. Right. He takes you where you need to go. Yes. And I think that day in and day out, we continue to have these wins and losses. And that scares people in faith because 
people were like, well, you know, my life was bad before I let Jesus into everything that I was doing. So right. it didn't get instantly better. He's not the magic genie that I rubbed the lamp and all of a sudden everything's okay. Right. How does that affect you? What do you do on those darkest days when well, you're I would struggling? Well, I would say this. I would say this. And uh, maybe if somebody's listening to this and hopefully they, they understand what I'm going to say is that don't be afraid to fail. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, to have Christ in your life. There's nothing to lose. There's only to gain. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the hardest part is telling that to somebody and then them doing it because it is. It is like walking through the darkest night and not knowing where you're going, right. but having that trust and love of Christ that knowing he's going to lead you exactly where you're supposed to. And when you look back, yeah. And the things that you've done, and even if it felt like you were in the dark, yeah. you're going to go, oh, I was, I was supposed to be exactly right there. That's what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. And he's, he's going to lead you, but it is. It, to me, my relationship now is I, I get up every day and I just say, Christ, lead me today to wherever you're going to go. Yeah. I'm in your hands. That's hard to do. But once you start doing it on a regular basis and take time to reflect and see where you've gone, Right. You're going to go, okay, yeah. I get it. I understand what, what's going on here. But just that moment of trust is a really big thing for people because there isn't a guarantee. You don't know exactly where you're going to go, but you have to have trust in God well, to and, where it's going to go. And as men, let's call it what it is. It's a little bit tougher for men in that surrender sure. aspect because to allow Christ to be in charge in some realms and in some people's eyes is weakness. Right, because sure. it's like, I'm supposed to be strong enough to do this myself. Right. I'm not supposed to cry. I'm not supposed to be the one to relinquish myself. You were a leader on the football field. Those 11 other guys you know, that are, that are with you, or 10 other guys, that we, I don't want to get a penalty, but we have 10 other guys <laughs> on the field with you, uh, you know, and they're expecting you to lead them. Guys look and say, how can I be the leader of my family if I'm surrendering to something that I can't see or I can't feel? What do we say to those guys in that moment? That's the greatest strength that you could ever find yeah. is trusting in that. Because I will say this, a guy who has been in that position where accomplishing the greatest thing that you can do as an athlete at, at a professional level, right? Yeah. It's all done by will and power on your own. Yeah. Now is the time and it should have been way before that, is that that will and that power could have came from Christ. Yeah. Imagine if you do that in your everyday life, if you're just, you know, your regular job, your regular family, whatever you're doing, imagine how much greater that family will be, how much greater that work will be yeah. if you put your trust in God. We have to make a prayer plan. We have to make the changes. We have to do everything that we possibly can so that when times of struggle are upon us, that we know that we can get to the top of the mountain once again where the Lord waits for us to show us His glory and His goodness no matter who we are or no matter what we've been through. That is the key to winning and losing. A strategy that not only allows us to say, hey, this is how we won, but a strategy that says, even though I gave it my all and I'm not on top, I know that there's a way that I can get back to the mountain where I can see everything the way the Lord wants me to see it and the way that I need to see myself. Amen? I think that for all of us, I think that there's an opportunity for us to win and lose and to do it with dignity and grace. And you are an amazing example. I'm, I'm proud to call you a friend. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to live life on the journey with you and, and to know you as Elvis, the, the leader and the man of his home. Uh, and we weren't friends when you played in the NFL, but uh, you know, I think that I'm sure that a lot of that shined through when you led those and they wanted to play for you as well. Uh, final two questions before you leave. Uh -oh. Real quick answers. <laughs> Favorite scripture verse? Oh boy, uh, there's so many. I would say, uh, like I just said, John's, John's Bread of Life discourse. John's Bread of Life The whole thing. All right, <laughs> favorite Catholic prayer? Oh, uh, for me, easy, the Our Father. Our Father. Just say it slowly and really understand what you're saying. That's, that's, 
the, the best advice I can give. A lot of times I think what people get is they get into that routine. Take the time to really pray slowly, almost like meditation and contemplation, uh, the words as they just flow through you. Awesome. Elvis, you're a brother. It's good to be with Thank you, my God. friend. Thank God you. God bless. So Elvis shared so many wonderful stories with us about how he became a true man and a true leader. And it wasn't just about what happened on the field, but it was about what he became when he lost and he could still see the blessings in his life. When we watch each of our lives, we see that God's hand is in everything that we do. And sometimes we might be at the highest point of the mountain and that isn't where we stay. We fall back down into the valley. But how can we see the goodness of who we are in that moment? And how can we still continue to grab the hands of those that we love and lead them on a journey with us so that they understand that they are never alone? And I think that for every one of us that we can be inspired by his story because we're just like Elvis. It doesn't matter that he played in the NFL. As I mentioned at the beginning, first and foremost, he's a child of God. And sometimes it takes us longer to realize that. So no matter where you are in your life, there's always a chance for you to say, Lord, I just need you to lead me. I can't do this on my own anymore. So let me ask you, what will you do today to allow God into places that you've never allowed him into before? What can you do in your life that says, Lord, help me to be strong enough in leading my family the way that you want me to lead them and to know that even when I lose, you are still with me every step of the way. Shown to me, oh God, the end is not the grave. 